So, welcome to Paris Pekin Tokyo seminar. So, it's my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker from Tokyo, Kenichi Bannai at Keio University and Riken. So, he will tell us today a Shintai generating class and the periodic polyrhythm for total real fees. So, please start. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for this opportunity to give a talk at this seminar. Yes, I think everyone probably says this, but it's my first time giving a seminar at Zoom. So a little bit not know how to do this. But today I'd like to talk about Shintani generating class and periodic pulse algorithms. It's a series of work that I've been working on with Kei Hagihara, Kazuki Yamada, and Shuji Yamamoto, and with lots of other people. And some preference are on the archive. So if you're interested, then please take a look at those. And so what the general story that I want to talk about today is really a very simple question. In the case of the rational field Q, there was this rational function one minus T, which is related to cyclotomic units. And if you take the logarithmic derivative, you get T over one minus T, which is known to be related to Dirichlet O values. So there's one very good generating function in this case. And in the case of imaginary quadratic fields, there's the Robert theta function, which is related to elliptic units. And if you take the logarithmic derivative, then you get this theta dash t over theta t, which is known to be related to Heckel values. So the simple question is, what do we have in the totally real field case? So do we have something that we can do? And what we want to talk about today is some generating function in this case, which gives Heke L values. And we want this to be very, very canonical. And so what I mean by very, very canonical is, is so consider the case of the rational field. So this, this GT is a rational function on GM. And so there's this classical theorem, which says that if you take the logarithmic derivative of this function k times and specialize at roots of unity, which is not one, because at one you have folds, then you get the special value of Lerch theta function. And so what is the Lerch theta function? It is a function given by this form where xz is some root of unity. So xn is just nth, nth power of the, the root of unity. And this function is known to have another continuation to the whole complex plane. And the relation to this layer theta function to the Dirichlet L values is, is that you have this lemma. So if you let C chi be this value here, then the Dirichlet character can be written in terms of the layer theta function like this. And the proof is very simple. It's just the finite Fourier transform of finite characters. So chi n can be written as some sum of these gzs. And then if you sum over n equals one to infinity, then you can prove that L chi s is of this form. And then you see that this is exactly their theta function. So yeah. So if you know the their theta function, then you know all the decree L values or the decree L function. So these their theta function is very, very useful. And what the theorem that I just gave said is that the GT, T over one minus T, it's one rational function. It's this one simple rational function, but this function knows all the values of the layer state of values for all Z's and all non-positive K's or minus K's. So yeah. So in case, what is amazing in this case is that you have just one very canonical function that knows all the twists and all the weights. So that is what we mean by a very canonical function. So if we go back to our picture, when I said that this knows Dirichlet L values, more precisely, I meant that this knows Lerch theta values. And in the case of imaginary quadratic fields, this Robert's theta function, I said it was Heckel L values, but more precisely, it's prove its theta values. And because of the functional equation, it's also Lerch theta values in this case. 
So we have a very good theory in the rational field case and the imaginary quadratic field case. So what can we do today? Is there a canonical function that knows Hecke L values? And then it's not really Hecke L values, but layer state of values that we want. So I want to talk about a very canonical class, which we call the Shintani generating class, which we construct to generate these layer state of values. So that is the main theme of today. And of course, there's been lots of people who have been studying zeta function of totally real fields. So our results based on old work by Shintani, it's sort of a reformulation of his work with some inputs from Barsky, Kasselnugas on construction of piadic Heckel functions for totally real fields, and also observation by Katz using an algebraic torus. And our results, I think, are also related somewhat to the works on Eisenstein co-cycles, Czech co-cycles, and Shintani co-cycles by mainly Das Gupta and his collaborators. And I think their work is more, more group theoretical in some sense. And there's also work by Berlinson, Levy, and Kings on the topological polar algorithms for totally real field case. And that work is a little bit more on the topological side. And I think our construction, I would say, is more algebraic. It arose from the study of polar algorithms in the totally real field case. And it's, the construction is very algebraic. And hopefully, it's a little bit, it's very simple to understand. So that is what I want to talk about today. So first, I want to talk about layer state of function for totally real fields. So I said that in the classical case, the layer state of function was very, very important. But in the totally real field case, it's not clear what layer state of function should be. So there's no, I don't think there's been a definition of layer state of function exactly of this form up until now. So what we want to investigate is finite Hecke characters for totally real fields. So we prepare some notations. So F is a totally real field with degree G and ring of integers. And we denote by F plus cross the group of totally positive elements in F. And we let I be the group of non-zero fractional ideals of F and IG those which are prime to G. And then we denote by CLF plus the, the class group, the narrow class group of F with conductor G, which is defined as such. And then a finite Hecke character is just a finite character on the narrow class group. And then by extending this Hecke character by zero to all the fractional ideals, then one can define the Hecke L function as this, which converges absolutely for the real part sufficiently greater than one. And then it has analytic continuation and other good properties that you want. And so we want to write these values in term of something the layer theta values. So how can we do this? So, well, we can write it like this because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between ideals and OF equivalent to A inverse and A I inverse alpha, where alpha is an element in the totally positive part of R divided by the unit because if you multiply alpha by unit, then it gives the same ideals. So dividing by this unit is really the difficulty in the higher dimensional case. Yeah, so this delta is the totally positive units and you have to divide by delta, which gives lots of trouble. And so we have this function here, this character here on each R plus, so we denote this by chi r, which is given like this. So it gives a character on r divided by gay r. And then if we replace this by this notation, then we have this. So how, how should the layer state of function in this case look like? So copying the case of the rational field, we take c chi z to be the finite Fourier transfer like this for some Z, which is an additive character on R divided by J R. Then finite Fourier transfer gives this formula here, very similar to the case of 
the rationals. And so a naive definition of the layer state of function would be is that one could try to define layer state of function as the sum over these z alpha. But the problem we face with this naive definition is, is that, so you want to sum alpha over r plus, but divided by the units. But the problem is this additive character z, this is not well-defined modulo the units. So we have a problem here. And how to avoid this problem is actually very simple. So what we do is because z modulo delta is not so good, we take the delta orbit of z and add all the z epsilon. So the units act non-trivially on the characters. So we add over all the orbits of z and then consider this function. And then this function itself is well-defined. So we define the layer state of function to be of this form, like this. And this is a very simple trivial point, but actually this has a very good interpretation in terms of geometry. So I want to emphasize what we're doing here. And then the finite Fourier transform becomes, so it was without dividing by delta before, without dividing by delta before, but if we divide by delta, then add all the delta orbits here, push it in here, then because chi r, it was defined by the Hecke characters, it's independent of multiplication by units. So this finite Fourier coefficient is independent of the action of the unit. So you can put it in here and you have this. And then, so if we use this formula to write out our Hecke O functions, then we have this. We just, we just plugged it, this in here to get this formula. And if you change the order of these, then you get this. And so this part here is exactly the layer theta function. So you get the formula like this. So what we just proved is the following theorem, or what we just proved is the following. So if we define the layer theta function to be of this form, then you can write all the finite Hecke characters in terms of some of these functions. So what I want, wanted to say here was, is that this Lerch theta function is very, very important that if you know all these functions, then you all know all the Hecke L, L functions. So in order to find the canonical generating function of the special values of these functions of finite Hecke characters, then it's sufficient to find a generating function for the layer state of function here. And so that that is the first section of my talk. So are there any questions up until here or is it okay or yeah mm -hmm. too fast or okay. Yeah it, it, it seems okay. Ah okay okay, okay. okay. yeah yeah all the uh last mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah offer okay. Okay, uh, so this is just a notation that maybe uh -huh. you were, can you go back several pages? Okay. To the definition mm -hmm. uh, of the thing modulo G. So mm -hmm. before, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so when you, you work with uh, mm -hmm. prime to G, I suppose this should be effective. Because you want to seem congruent to one or G, so it should be the gothic G is effective. Is a what? What do you mean by effective? No, no, G, the gothic G. When you write gothic fraction, G. Like a prime yeah, to yeah. gothic G. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. This is a, a, you say G first it was a fractionary ideal, but here it should be actually. Ah, right, 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 right. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's an integral ideal, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay, and mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the definition in the classical case of the large death function? Mm -hmm. Large theta function, yeah. Mm -hmm. On just the previous page also? This? Okay, this. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and, and your convention for Dirichlet characters is that 
you you consider them uh, you consider primitive dict directly character that is yes. yeah in in most of the formulas yes yeah mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah i mean some parts it doesn't have to be primitive but in most of the important formulas we assume primitive yes mm -hmm. yeah so it's the usual mm -hmm. uh, for okay mm -hmm. Because sometimes they it gives different okay okay mm -hmm. yeah okay okay mm -hmm. yeah please go ahead okay 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 mm -hmm. so go back to the please mm -hmm. okay so that was so that was the definition of the layer state of function and we think this is very important because it knows about finite Hecke characters and the Hecke L functions. And yeah, so I mean, what one one thing we realize when doing this research is that when one tries to use the formula for layer state of function, then many formulas become very simple and easy to understand. So it's just a minor tweak, but I think it helps to streamline the theory. So next, I want to talk about Shintani zeta function and the generating function. So the layer zeta function itself, it doesn't a priori have a good generating function. But what we want to use is the generating function for Shintani zeta function studied by Shintani. So in the next section, I want to talk about Shintani zeta function and the generating function for those functions. And so we let i be the embeddings of f into the reals. And since the degree of f is g, so we have g embeddings. And for the sake of order, we're just going to number them. So we fix an order, which means that f tensor r is isomorphic to rg, the g dimensional real space. And for any alpha tensor one, you just embed into rg by each of the embeddings here. And then, in Shintani theory, we have to think about cones. And we define a cone in R plus G U zero as follows. This plus means the positive part of R. So it does not include zero, so you have to include zero here. And we define a cone. In this talk, we say a, we define a cone to be a G-dimensional F-rational simplicial closed polyhedral cone. And it's very long. So I'm just going to say just cone in this talk. But it's any, any subset of R plus G union zero of the form this. So it's a closed cone for some basis alpha one, alpha G and F plus G linearly independent over R. And in this case, we say that alpha is the generator of sigma alpha. So I wrote F plus G, but usually, yeah, usually one takes some fractional ideal here and then take a basis as a fractional ideal. So what, so the Shintani zeta function, what it is, is if you take a fractional ideal R and for a cone and some torsion element of this additive character, we define the Shintani zeta function by this formula. So you have this cone here for this torsion point Z or torsion point, I mean, additive character, and then G variable complex numbers. And then you sum over alpha in this place. And this is the intersection of R with the upper closure of the cone. And what is the upper closure of the cone it is basically, so you add some points on the cone and maybe if you're smart, then this notation is sufficient for you. But yeah, when Yamamoto-san first told me this, I couldn't follow what he was saying. So what the upper numbering is, is for the case when the dimension is two, so a cone is something in R2. So a closed cone is something like this. And what the upper closure is, is 
you always take one direction to be up and you include one side to be closed and the, all the other ones to be open. So the definition is if you move a little bit downwards in one direction and if it's in sigma, then you include it. So th this point here is in the upper closure because if you move down a little bit, it's included. But this, this border here is not because if you move down, then it goes outside. So it's because when you want to paste together the cones, then you want to count the boundaries without redundancy. So you have to put in some system of how to put in the borders and that is just for this. So the upper closure is something like this. And then, so the Shintani Zeta function is you just take the upper closure of a cone intersection with the integral ideal and you just sum over all of them. So this is a G variable complex function and it is known to have an analog continuation to the whole complex plane. And then why these cones are important is, is because of the Shintani decomposition, which was first proved by Shintani. And this version, upper closure version was proved by my colleague Yamamoto-san. And so what they proved is that there exists a set phi of G dimensional cones, which is stable under the action of delta, such that if you divide it by delta, then it's a finite set. So you have a finite representation or a finite, yeah, it can be represented by a finite number of cones module the action of delta. And then all the R plus G can be written as the sum of the upper closures of the cone in phi. So it's a way to break down this, this area into very nice parts. And using this decomposition, what is important about this decompo decomposition is that if you take a torsion point in Z, uh, time some additive character, which is not equal to one, then you can divide this. So this is the definition of the layer theta function. But then because, because of this summation here, you can write it in terms of the Shintani zeta function of the cones in phi. So you wanted to, we wanted to sum over R, R plus modulo delta, but this phi divided by delta gives the fundamental area of R plus divided by delta. So that's how we use the Shintani decomposition to calculate the layer zeta function in terms of the Shintani zeta function. And because Shintani zeta functions, you had to add over all the orbits of the Z, we also take all the orbits over Z of the Shintani zeta function. And then we have this nice formula. Yeah, and so what is good about this Shintani zeta function is that it has a generating function. So Shintani proved that there is a generating function for this func function. So we want to now talk about the generating function of the Shintani zeta function. And so where does the generating functions live? So in the very classical case, it was t over t minus one, which was a rational function on GM. And in the totally real field case, we've already seen, I've already introduced this notation. So this is the homomorphism, additive hom from A to C star. So A is additive and C, C star is C crosses multiplicative. So it is characters multiplicative additive or additive characters, yeah, in here. And these objects have a underlying scheme. So in the case of GM, it's home so that GM. And for this, it's just home a GM, which written as an affine scheme is of this form. So this T alpha is, if you have T to the alpha and T to the alpha dash, then the multiply you get t to the alpha plus alpha dash. So you have this natural multiplication here and it's a fine scheme. And in the case of the classical case, it was t over one minus t. So we want to see what comes over here. And 
a little bit of preparation, we say that an element in an ideal I is primitive if for any n, if you divide alpha by n, then it's no longer in the ideal. And we denote by script AR, the set of primitive elements in R. Then if we take a basis G like this and the cone generated by this, it should be alpha, I'm sorry. And then define the function, rational function like this, where P alpha is like the fundamental parallel pipe that defined by these bases. And then hat is just the upper closure. So this is a finite sum. So this is a simple polynomial, a rational function on TA. And we let u alpha r be tr minus the divisor t alpha equals one. Then Shintani proved the following theorem. So for any integer k1 to kg greater than or equal zero and torsion point in here, if you take the derivative of this function here and plug in t equals zeta, then you get the Shintani zeta values. So, so Shintani proves that for Shintani zeta functions, there's a very, very nice rational function. And here, delta tau is the differential satisfying delta tau t alpha is alpha tau t alpha. So this is a differential and for any embedding. Actually, if you take the complex valued points of the algebraic torus, then this really corresponds to the direction of differentiating between with respect to the embedding of the real in that direction. But it's also an algebraic differential operator and it is defined as such. So we have this very nice generating function. So we had this generating function and we had this formula connecting their zeta values and Shintani zeta functions. So, so if we just take the sum, because it's the sum like this, uh, I, I think I forgot maybe this, but yeah, if we take the sum like this, then yeah, we're just summing and this is the generating function for this. Then we get a nice uh, formula like this. So this is a generating function to our value like this. So this looks very nice. And I think up until now in many theory, this function was used many, many times. But our criticism of this function is, is that First, this function depends on Z, the point that you want to investigate. And the second criticism is that this function depends on the choice of the Shintani decomposition. So Shintani decomposition is a very nice decomposition and you can prove that it exists, but there are many, many ways to take Shintani decomposition. And so it, this function is not so canonical. So these two things are something that we wanted to avoid in our research. So how can we create a canonical generating function? That was the question that we really thought about. And the answer is, is our Shintani generating class. And so what we do is we use these functions to create a very canonical generating class, which really knows the values of all the layer theta functions. And so, but to start, I want to define some actions on our torus, algebraic torus TR. So if you take any positive element F plus cross, then if you multiply by X, then you get trivially multiplication by X gives an isomorphism of OF modules R and XR. And this gives an isomorphism of algebraic tori Txr congruent to Tr. And on the c-valued points, you can really see it explicitly. Uh, a c-valued point of this is, is a character from xr to c star, c cross. And then if you map this by x, then you get zx, which maps r to c cross. But the definition of zx is just, you take multiplication by x on the inside. So it's a very natural map. And so if epsilon, so if X is an unit, then if you multiply a unit by an ideal, then you get the same ideal. So you get an isomorphism from TR to TR. So you have an action of delta on TR. 
but but more generally, we can take all the sum over all the TRs for all fractional ideals, then you can multiply by x and get an isomorphism like this. So you get an action of f plus cross on t. And one of our idea, especially when working on the case when the class number is greater than one, is that this t is really a nice guy to work with. And so we have an action of group on the torus. So we want to say a little bit about equivariant sheaves and cohomology of this object. So actually, we don't work on t, but we want to work on u, which is you take out all the units from each of the components. And then u also has an action of f plus cross induced from the action of t. And an equivariant sheaf is so something a sheaf on u which is has good properties with respect to the group action so the precise definition is this so for each x you have an isomorphism which is compatible with the composition compatible with the composition means that this diagram is commutative so an equivariant sheaf is just a set of a family of sheaves on each of the components of u r which behaves well with respect to the group action. So you have an isomorphism here for each group element of the group X. And then you can define the equivariant cohomology by just the right derived functor of this and M derived functor of taking the global section and then taking the group invariant part. And so this is a very abstract definition, but what we do is we construct explicit complex to calculate this cohomology, especially in this case. So we want, we give an explicit complex to calculate this. So let u alpha r be, you take out the divisor t alpha equals one for each alpha. Then this gives an open covering, a fine open covering of u because you're taking out just the divisors t alpha equals one. And if you if you take the sum of all of it, you're just, only the unit is removed from each R component. Then again, this F plus cross acts on the indexes and the open sets. And then we can define the equivariant check complex simply by so if you have a F plus cross equivariant sheaf on U, then just define the complex as this. So R is for each component and for each index alpha. So Q plus one components, then it's just a usual check complex, but with the invariant part here. And one can make this into a different into a, a complex by taking the differential to be the usual check differential. Differential. Then what we can do is we can prove that actually this complex calculates the equivariant cohomology of U with respect to the action of F plus cross. So yeah, this is a very good complex to calculate this cohomology. And so what we do is we fix once and for our numbering of uh, embeddings, then for any alpha, so alpha G elements in here, define the sign of alpha to be the sign of the matrix of each component with respect to the each embedding. So it is plus one or minus one. And then if we take the, generating function, oh, there should be an R here somewhere, R here. But if you take the Shintani generating function and multiply it by sine alpha, then actually this, all of this defines an element in here. And what we could prove is, is that actually this element defines a co-cycle. And then because it forms a co-cycle, it forms a very canonical class. It forms a single canonical class in the cohomology here. So our question up until now was, 
we had lots and lots of generating function and lots and lots of cones. And the natural question we asked at first was how to take a canonical choice. But actually the answer is the best is not to choose. You take all of it. And if you take all of it, then all of them together form a single canonical cohomology class. So this is what we call the Shintani generating class. Excuse me, what is the sign of matrix? Sign of the matrix is, so the determinant is positive or negative. So if it's ah. positive, then it's plus one and negative, it's minus one. So you take the determinant? Yeah, uh, okay, yes. Mm. Sign of the determinant, uh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is to make the uh, check cycle cancel out properly, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, the generating function pays together to form a single canonical class. And so we were very happy with this observation. And, but what can we do with this class? So the differential delta, if you multiply all the delta tiles, then you get the differential delta. And this is a differential, but actually this induces a homomorphism on the equivariant cohomology because it induces a map on the complex. And so delta is all the delta tau together. So if you delta the T alpha, then it's the norm of alpha times T alpha. So it's a differential given by this. And what we could prove is as follows. So for any integer k greater than or zero and any torsion point z in Tr for any r, so the Shintani generating class lived here, but if you take the differential k times, then this guy also lives in here. And if you specialize this point at this point z, then you can specialize. So it gives a it gives an element in the cohomology of an equivariant point. And it's the G minus first cohomology. And on a point, it may seem like it disappears, but fortunately, delta is isomorphic to Z G minus one. So it has rank G minus one. And the cohomology of this is just a group cohomology of this. So you have one dimension surviving. So Actually, it's a cohomology class, but you can evaluate this cohomology class at the point because the point with this action of delta is one dimensional. And when we evaluate our Shintani generating class, then what we can prove is, is that it actually gives the layer zeta values in this case. And this works for any integer k, positive integer k, and any torsion point z, which is different from one. So this means that this GT knows all the layer zeta values for all non-positive values, non-positive integers and all characters. So this is this formula here. This is a, gen a very clear generalization of the case when G equals one. I mean, it gives all the values for positive integers and all torsion points. So that is our main theorem. So uh, do you have questions up until here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it looks okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, so now I want to talk about periodic polylogarithms because I mean, I, I like to study polylogarithms and this research started originally from trying to figure out the polylogarithm in this case. And so our observation now allows us to define the periodic polylogarithms very clearly in this case. But we want to talk about the periodic case. So we fix an embedding of Q bar into C and Q bar into CP, the usual embeddings. And we let K be a finite extension of QP containing the Galois closure of F. And so uh, this is a little bit complicated, but what we're doing is just thinking about the rigid analytic spaces associated to what we just used so far up until now. So A is just the okay version of the ring of 
TR, then you take the phenoid space attached to this. And then you remove T alpha minus one and take the affinoid space. So these are all periodic affinoid spaces. So what we're doing is, so we're not just removing the point T alpha equals one, but we're removing the residue disk around T alpha equals one, but still um, it's some periodic analytic space. And then, yeah, then UK hat I, you just define to be the sum of all these you take residue disks out, then you then you take all the union. And then you had k is this union over all the fraction ideals. So you have this periodic analytic ring. And then what we could prove is that for any fractional ideal i in of f and for any integer k and cone sigma, if we divine this polynomial by this sum, it is very similar to the sum that we use for the generating function, but we have this here. We remove, we consider only the alpha in A tensor ZP star, and A tensor ZP star is the set of generators of the OF tensor ZP module, A tensor ZP. So we sort of remove the parts divisible by P in some sense then what we can prove is, is that this itself is a formal power series, but one can prove that in fact, this is a limit of polynomials and hence it defines a rigid analytic function in here. And we have this for R and sigma like before. So what we could prove is that when we bring in the sign again, if you attach the sign to these polynomials, then you get an element in here again. And then we could prove that this defines a co-cycle, so it forms a canonical class again in here. So you have rigid analytic spaces this time instead of algebraic ones, but still you have something in here. And actually what we could do with this function is that we are able to prove that it's related to special values of periodic all functions. And I just show sort of explain this. So this is again a cohomology class, but you can specialize this to points again. So this is a class which lives in here, but if you specialize, I'm sorry, specialize, then the point is again, because delta has a rank G minus one, there is one dimensional left. So you can think about the value of this. So this point is well-defined. So, so using these values of the periodic polylogarithm, we want to relate it to periodic L functions. And so what is the periodic L functions in this case? So the periodic L function for totally real field case was, it's a old result by Barsky, Kassel, Nugas, and Lean, Ribet. And Lean and Ribet, they used modular forms or Hilbert modular forms. And the one which is closer to ours is, probably the one by Kassanukas. And, but the periodic L function is certain function on ZP, S on ZP, which interpolates all the Hecke L values of the finite Hecke characters. So because it's a periodic interpolation, you have this a little bit Tychy Mueller character coming in, but in any case, and you have to remove some P Euler factors, but in any case, you have this interpolation. And, and before going into the details, just one more thing about these torus T, which is interesting. So if you have an integral ideal B, then R B is in R for any fractional ideal R, which means that this inclusion defines a map from T R to T R B. So, and if you sum over all the fractional ideals, you get a map like this. And actually we can prove that this action is compatible with the action of F plus R star. So if you look at the G torsion points of each torus and take the primitive part, the zero means the primitive part and sum together and divide by F plus cross, then you get sort of the G torsion point of the quotient stack in some sense. 
And what is interesting about this is, is that this row B actually gives an action of the ideal class group on T0G, which is simply transitive. So this looks very much like complex multiplication theory, where if you have an elliptic curve with complex multiplication, then the because of the Galois action, the ideal class group acts on the torsion points of the elliptic curve. For our torus also, this class group acts on the get G torsion point. However, in this case, these are all defined over Z or Q. So unfortunately, this doesn't have any Galois action of the totally real field. So I'm a little bit at a loss what to think about this, but this action of this ideal class group on this, which is simply transitive, is something very interesting. And so for if, if you have a element G torsion point Xi in TIG, then we denote by Xi B the image by rho B like this. And so the result concerning periodic L function is as follows. So suppose G does not divide any power of P. So G is an integral ideal, as Ofer said, which does not divide any power of P and let Z be an arbitrary primitive G torsion point in here. Then for any integer K, we have this formula. So the value of periodic L function at any integer can be written as a sum of a Gauss sum, some Gauss sum, and the points of the periodic L function here. So this is a very natural generalization of a result by Coleman in the case when F equals Q. He proved that the classical periodic polylogger function can be used to write the kubota leopold periodic L function. But using our periodic L function or using our periodic polylogarithm, we could prove we could prove a very similar result in this case. I mean, so so maybe it's not, I don't go into the detail of the proof, but the existence of the row B, the action of the ideal class group makes this formula very, very simple. And so, so I mean, I want to understand what that is doing, but I don't yet have a feel of how things should be. So this is the result concerning periodic L function. So are there any questions up until here? Everything okay? Yeah, okay. it's okay. Okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Okay, so yeah, so I maybe I rushed too, too fast, but yeah. So that is basically what I wanted to talk about today. Oh, so. wait, wait, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 I no, I just, I just wanted to see again the, mm. the, the formula where you had something with primitive points acting. I didn't quite catch the, mm -hmm. the what is okay. just the, all the notation and so on. Mm. So I, mm. uh, so mm. this is what uh, a runs over uh, the fractional ideals of f. All the non-zero fractional ideals. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, and so mm -hmm. this then will permute. Ah, okay, then and then gives an action mm -hmm. on this, which is simply transitive. Okay, this is not difficult mm -hmm. to see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, this, this object has an action of this. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not difficult to see. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the conclusion is so what? So I guess I talked about what I w wanted to talk about. So what we did was we newly defined the layer theta function for totally real fields, and so what we did was we did not just take the point, but we took the delta orbit of the point to define it, and it gave a very nice function. And then we constructed the Shintani generating class as a canonical class and cohomology of a certain algebraic torus with an action of F plus cross. 
And then we were able to prove that it generates all the non-positive special values of large theta functions for all non-trivial finite characters. So we were able to prove an analog of the case when t equals one. Then using this idea of thinking not about functions, about cohomology classes, definition of the periodic polarism became very, very natural. So one did not want to find a periodic polarism function, but one wanted a periodic polarism class. And then, then it's very natural. You just remove the P, P part and it gives a periodic polarism function. And then one can prove that it's related to special value of periodic Heckel functions for totally real fields. So that generalizes the result by Coleman. And so the conjectures and questions that we have is, is this research originally started because I wanted to understand or we wanted to understand with my colleagues, basically the theory by Neckover and Scholl on plectic structures in the totally real field case. And we wanted to find good examples of varieties with plectic structures that we could work on. And it seems that this algebraic torus seemed to be a very good candidate. And so we yet don't have a good equivariant plectic polylogarithm theory or hot theory or things like this. But because of our calculations, we sort of conjecture that the specialization to torsion points of the equivariant plectic, I should say Hodge, Hodge the real Hodge realization of the equivariant plate positive algorithm for T should be related to positive values of our layer theta functions. So in the case when F equals Q or G equals one, the layer theta functions are in fact the special values of polylogarithm functions. And I guess this should be the natural generalization would be is that the polylogarithm function specialized to torsion points should give layer theta functions, special values of layer theta functions. And also in the Hodge case, we have no idea how to do the calculations. In the Santomic realization case, we are not able to make the theory work just yet, but we have lots of periodic differential equations and calculations. And it seems to be that the Santomic realization of the equivalent plectic polarogram for T may be expressed using our periodic polarograms. So today I just introduced the version with just one integer K, but in fact, one can do a plectic version where you have G weights. And then these G weighted polarogram function seems to describe the Santomic realization. So in level of calculations, I think we have some results, but we are not able to fit it into a formalism just yet. So I'm curious how, to, how things should go. And finally, this stack. So taking T to be all the sum over all the fractional ideals, then dividing by F plus star, the G torsion points of this stack so maybe a G torsion point doesn't make sense, but if you sum over all the G torsion points, then it gives something with a natural action of the ideal class group. So this sort of looks like complex multiplication theory, but without Gallo action. So I don't know what is a good way to think about this. If one could define some F structure on this, I don't know if this makes sense on this, object, and then if there is some way to put in a natural Galois action structure and make it compatible with the action of the ideal class group, then can one do something with, with so, yeah, Kronecker's Jungian Traum or how, how mm -hmm. to, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't have any ideas, but I'm curious to see how this can go. So I think that's what I wanted to say today so thank you very much for your attention yeah thank you very much okay. thank you. so uh so you discussed on this uh l, uh, l value so uh this l value can be regarded as uh, the constant term of eisenstein series so mm -hmm. in, in, so 
can, can one imagine that you are, you are Rahi, uh, theta function can be some constant term of something? Probably, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't really thought about this, but I don't know what the right framework is. Some maybe Hilbert modular mm. thing, and then yeah, you degenerate to the cusps, then you get these torus, and yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I would imagine something like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Oh, that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, are there more questions? I, I think it's, yeah, offer raise his hand, and I think also another participant, mm -hmm. uh, Shuji mm -hmm. Zhao, raise his hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. How, how, how do I see? Do, who gets to see who is raising You cannot hands? see, probably we only can see. So, maybe offer, and then. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, so again, I asked to, to show me uh, again mm -hmm. the, the point where you discussed the, the, the computation using certain kind of check or cycles I, uh -huh, of the uh -huh. covariant cohomology. So this, yeah. uh, so Maybe just, this. Yeah. I, want, uh -huh. I want just to, again, the notation. Mm -hmm. So you, you, uh, you take the torus modulo a uh, for any uh, uh, for all you mean for all you mean uh, mm -hmm. tr for equal one for any means for all no uh, this is the what notation is and here here yeah here for all for all yes no no, no but for what you. what is a uh, ah, ah okay this is for uh -huh. some, okay so okay no. uh, this is just a notation for one and then this is the covering and can you show the definition of a a no. a a is the primitive element in r so ah okay mm -hmm. uh, and it? then mm -hmm. okay uh, and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay this is all in on zero mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Okay, so it, there is no fixed, so everything, all the action is free. So there is no, because you repeat. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. okay, the action is free, so there is no problem. Okay. Right, exactly, exactly. That's how you prove, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so mm -hmm. thank you. I, just, yes. uh, I was confused. Yes. I thought that you, you had mm -hmm. some, uh, okay, it was not, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah. So, Mladen, yeah. you can ask yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you for your talk. I just have a question. It's a little bit of a follow-up of uh, mm -hmm. the question. So, uh, you have this interpolation formula, which is the usual formula for a periodic L function of um, the linear bad L function. Mm -hmm. So, um, so sometimes, um, you can have an exceptional zero uh, if you can show the formula. Um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, yeah. So, so, mm -hmm. so for um, well, in your normalization, that's for uh, yeah, k equals zero. So, for example, if um, if the character is trivial at p at gothic at many gothic p's, it has a multiple mm -hmm. zero. That's gross conjecture. Um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm these derivatives at zero has been studied, but I mean, because your formula later is true for all K, right? So if it's your K is yeah. uh -huh. positive, but like very periodically close to zero, mm -hmm. uh, then can this, does this give some, some insight, like the, the fact that the high power of P would divide the value uh, at, uh, because you have an actual zero at K equals zero. So this means mm -hmm. that since your formula is true for all K, like if K is very, positive but periodically close to zero so that does this give some insight um i don't know i so i don't know if our formulation gives additional insight as with respect to what was already known because would that be right yeah okay. because yeah because yeah 
No, I, I don't mean additional mm -hmm. insight right. for zero, mm -hmm. but right. like, can you exploit mm -hmm. this with some other point and say mm -hmm. something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't thought about this, so I don't know exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But, yeah. Thank. Thank you for the question. So yeah. So what what kind of problems are interesting in this direction? So. Well, what's interesting to me is, is related to what the Keshe Act uh, asked. I mean, this, this uh, Pierre-Kell function is a constant um, term of an Eisenstein right. series. Right, right, so, right, right. For right, example, right. it's uh, mm -hmm. zeros are related to some, uh, for example, mm -hmm. interesting phenomenon on the Eigen curve and things like this. Right, but, right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so please go ahead. Uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, I want to know: uh, Are there any Kummer congruence satisfied by the new analytic function LP in, in your talk? Uh, so. So, so the periodic Paul logarithm functions, it's sort of defined via Kummer congruence in some case, in some sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, when one tries, when I said that this power series converges as a, as a limit of polynomials, that is sort of the Kummer type congruence that is used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. Like, I start with this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that everything fits together means that there's lots of Kummer congruences everywhere. I think in the okay. in the totally real field case, it's very different from the imaginary quadratic, where if the prime is super singular, then it does lots of bad things. And the totally real case, uh, yeah, it's very flat. So it, everything looks like, uh, yeah, okay, a multiplicative okay. group. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, are there more questions? Okay, if not, uh, thank you very much for the speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.